Hi there, I'm Eric Meeks, broker owner of Remax Desert Properties in Palm Springs and Indian Wells. And today I've got a friend of mine, Isa Lapage, who's also a Palm Springs businessman, owns a step-by-step -step dance moves uh, downtown. How are you doing today, Isa? Great. Thank you for having me this morning. Well, you're, let me just say step-by-step -step dance studio. Dance studio. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I met Isa 20 or 30 years ago now, and uh, he taught me how to dance. And... Uh, don't let me be the example for all of you because many people do much better, but I will tell you I am grateful for what I was able to learn in the time that Isa taught me, and so is my wife. So um, today we're going to talk about the war in Ukraine. Um, Isa is from that region of the world. Um, tell me a little bit about where you grew up. I grew up on, uh, there is a region called, now it's actually a sovereign country called Kosovo, Republic of Kosovo. That's where I grew up. Okay. And that part of the land was chopped off from the mother country called Albania in 1913, Congress of London, and also after the World War II, the big powers, or the powers to be at that time, decided to give that portion to satisfy uh, Yugoslavia. So he, three million Albanians were locked out of the mother country. So that's where I grew up, in Kosovo. In, in Kosovo. Yeah. And for some reason, I thought it had something to do with the war in Bosnia that happened in the late 90s. Yeah, well, the the autonomy it used to be an autonomous region of Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Kosovo, and the northern part is Vojvodina, which you have a close to a million Hungarians on that region in there. Um, but Albania said had always had a, a desire to be united with the mother country because we have the same language, we're the same blood, basically. Okay. And that's what the conflict with Serbs has been always on and off. But it really, it mushrooms in, in 1989. You had a decade there when Tito died. Okay. When I, I think it was in 1981, that's when he died. And it created all kinds of problems in there. Well, and now, help me transition that knowledge of, of you in, in the region and to where we are in the war in Ukraine, in Ukraine and some of your feelings about that. The, the way these things work is that uh, the certain areas after the major empires collapsed, like Austro-Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian Empire, okay. same thing when uh, Ottoman Empire collapsed. That's where you have a big war in Syria, not too long ago. Okay. And in uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, basically, the borders were right in the Ukraine. So people fluctuated; they moved from one area to the other, for one reason or another. Was that, then, was that all refugee type movement or was that just normal immigration? Normal immigration because Austrian Hungarian Empire decided that to have a flux of different nationalities but always was ruled by Austria and Hungary. Okay. The decision making was basically in Vienna. And then when the World War II came, or even before that, then Stalin did really a, a a change, he really shifted populations. Okay. He did that with Chechens, for example. You know, and all these places are uh, ringing little buzzwords in my ear because Syria, I remember uh, Russia being involved in a war there. Yes. Not that long ago, no. like uh, five years ago or something no, like it, that. Well, actually, they still have troops in there. And, and uh, Chechnya, again, Chechnya is there. right north uh, in a border with Georgia, I believe. You have two other republics underneath them. You have uh, Ingushtia and Dagestan, right south of that. They border with Caspian Sea, basically. Chechnya is landlocked. Okay. And um, they had a war, actually, during the Yeltsin years, two wars with, uh, with Chechens. They wanted to have a republic of their own. And then Putin were there. He buys these, uh, what do you call, pays off these regional leaders. Okay. And makes them very dependent on them. That's why they survive in power in there. Even now in Ukraine, you have some Chechen fighters fighting in there for Russians. Hmm. Okay. So now, uh, the last month or more, okay, we've all been watching what's going on in Ukraine. You know, on uh, CNN, major news net networks, the right. internet, and uh, I, I find it horrible. I find it atrocious. And uh, personally, I wish that we were doing even more. I'm glad for what we're doing, but I wish we were doing more. Where are your thoughts on what's happening in Ukraine right now? I think it's disgusting from President Putin, if you want to phrase 
referring to him like that. I mean, acknowledge him. He's the president of Russia to invade a country who has not done one thing against your people, meaning Russian people. Uh, but Russia, actually, Russian, uh, they're losing the war, actually, right now. I hope you're right. They, I, they are, the last two days, mm -hmm. especially, I've been uh, hearing about major assaults and Russian victories going on in Mariupol and uh, Lviv. Those are, remember, you know, since he has, he's an autocrat, meaning we're really a dictator, yes. bar none. He controls pretty much everything, the media, what comes out of there, uh, you can take with a grain of salt, basically. But thousands of thousands of Russians have died. I think if the figures are correct, probably close to 30,000 of them have died. Uh, you just, there is another small republic called Ossetia, which is right in the north of Chechnya there. Those soldiers, you Sorry, might not I'm, I'm going to zoom map. in a little bit here. Okay. Uh, um, they, they send these people to fight the Russians with hardly any hardware on now, I'm going to scoot over here a little bit. I hope that our viewers at home can see that. But there's Mariupol. Yeah. Okay, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Yeah. I can't uh, yeah. claim yeah. to speak the language there. Where is that last city that you were talking about? Ossetia is farther, farther this oh. way, farther down. Oh, and it's on... It's, uh, a, it's a Russian part. So bring the map closer to this way. No, no, this way. Push it this way. And when you see the Georgia down here in the bottom, and you can see Ossetia right there, uh, a little bit north of that. Oh, it's, okay, so it's an inland one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 And they all depend on Russian help. So I had to zoom out to orient myself a little bit on the countries. Right, okay. right. I see. Now, but that's not for the war in Ukraine right now. That must have been some earlier thing that Russia did. Right, but the soldiers from those republics, like from Chechnya and Ossetia, are basically fighting they're the ones in Russian side. So okay. I suspect that what Russia has done, that's why they're poorly performing. Okay. Is that because their equipment is outdated to begin with. And I'm not a military expert expert. I'm just looking from a historical point of view. Second thing there is that they probably emptied the jails of all the criminals that he has in Russian prisons and sent send them to do the damage to the civilian population in Ukraine and scaring the people and these people are savages let's put it this way they're criminals okay well I I would also um, I would wonder if he's picking areas uh, for soldiers to come from outside of you know mother Russia homeland you know uh, where uh, probably as great a support is is a way of protecting the families there from suffering the death of their sons very easy. Well, that's what he's saying. That's, Ossetia is a good example. Right. So if you those, pick an area yeah. where y y you aren't as concerned about what happens no. to those people, no. then you protect the families closest to you and you protect your power. The, the, the way I remember is that uh, especially the violation or violating the women and youth, that's a kind of an undeclared kind of a, nobody wants to talk about it. But that's what they're doing. They're doing a um, kind of a, a hidden agenda. You know, when you do those things, you scare population, and naturally they want to leave. Well, I, I would see a long-range goal of this is so that Russia, or not, not Russia necessarily, but Putin, could look at whatever is the next country that maybe had left Russia earlier because Easy. since World War II, I mean, right. Russia, we had the Eastern Bloc, but then when the Berlin Wall came down, some of those countries right. left Russia he might be looking forward to being able to scare each one of those other countries. Look, I'll go into you too. I remember when we were talking about Berlin Wall, people are always using these fancy phrases, you know, Berlin Wall fell. Right, it yes. Actually was dismantled, which is a very big distinction between the two words, okay? Uh, people fall, actually went there and took that, it apart. That, yeah, that, that's correct. But talking about that region in the, in the northern part, by the Baltic Sea, you have Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Those are republics. Right. Who... If you go to the north up here. Yep. You can see them right there in the Baltic Sea. There is Estonia, Latvia, and there is Lithuania. Now, those ones, uh, in my uh, opinion, and I'll admit I'm a little novice on Eastern Bloc geopolitics, I've always viewed those as being tied very much with Russia. At, from 19, uh, during the 1919, right after the Peace of Versailles, Okay. World War, World War After World War I, yes. yes. 
Woodrow Wilson, a great American president, people don't give him much credit, but he actually was, is that, of course, he took a, a, a beating at home because he said in 1917, 16, he was not going to go to war. That's how he got elected or re-elected. But then, then we he, went to war. he had to go to war. Let's put it this way. Uh, these were independent. Then, for one reason or another, again, Lenin and Stalin, you know, playing these games in there. Then they, after the World War II, actually they were kind of occupied. And what Russia did there, again, Stalin here, moved a lot of Russian populations on those regions to dilute the ethnicity. That's what these people do. I, I can understand. I've, seen, I've heard that story throughout history about yeah. why armies rape the women and repopulate the country right. and move people around, which is all horrible reasons. It is. It was but, happening, same thing in Bosnia, you know, like not to change the subject, but it has a lot of similarities in there. I mean, there is no such a thing in Bosnian Muslim country. It doesn't exist. Right, Bos okay. Bosnian Muslims, if we use the phrase for just conversational purposes, are Slavic Muslims. They are kin to Croatians and Serbs. Okay. An example would be like you and I are brothers, and you decided to be a Catholic, and I want to become a Protestant. But we are same blood. So right. how can we be different? That's yeah. what the Slavic Muslims are in Bosnia. I, I hear you. I, you know, now, I, same I, thing in here. What he's doing is that in the eastern part of Ukraine, there's a lot of, it was a percentage of Russians living in there. He used that pretext to defend them, but nobody was bothering them anyway. I'm talking about Putin here. So he used that as an excuse that we're going to go in and all he's doing really is uh, acquiring land. Yeah, the peace by peace. Heaven forbid Russia ends up winning and uh, securing and, and keeping, okay, Ukraine on that there. But whoever ends up winning Ukraine is going to have a major rebuild. I mean, uh, there, there doesn't yeah. look like there's a lot of it good places be, left. Do you know that we still have a Marshall Plan in existence in Europe? There was a Marshall Plan. I remember it. Yep. After the World War II. It was our taxpayers' money. Of course, I wasn't even in this country. I wasn't even born there. Right. But again, uh, the American leadership at that time had a vision. There was Truman, by the way, during that time, after Roosevelt passed away. It was about rebuilding Europe. And he did. We rebuilt Japan. Mm -hmm. But that plan is still there. And we'll need a plan like that or that need, plan. You're going to need a European Marshall Plan. But the good thing about that is that, you know, all these yachts and all these um, mansions right. that are being confiscated, you know, why not sell them and have the money go directly to Ukraine? It could be, could be billions of dollars in there. I, I would agree. And, yeah. and I think that we will see that happen. I think right now these things are still being litigated on those levels to some degree. But if the American government wanted to, yeah. they could simply claim it. Well, we have a bunch of mansions uh, in New York to start with, right there, right. Russian-owned. I'm right. talking about these oligarchs, not an ordinary Russian, you know. I mean, we have to make a distinction between an ordinary Russian, civilian, citizen. Russian citizen versus the moron that is in there in, in Moscow. I mean, the guy is really lunatic. I right. Mean, he's beginning to think that maybe his marbles are not working right. I, I I tend to agree with you. He, yeah. he definitely, I think, uh, most of the Western world, okay, yeah. would agree with you. We have placated him for a long time, though. He started a long, long time ago with Putin. He's been there for like 20 odd years, you know. And know. we kind of make giving in. Putin is a bully, basically. That's what it is. And you know, sometimes you have to stop these bullies. Yes, well, and I think it's time. Yes, per personally, yes. I would be okay if the U.S. even committed troops to Ukraine. And I know that right. that's got some major negative implications that could come from that. Right. But I think eventually you do have to just stand up to the bully. Yeah, uh, we don't, I know you and I have a different view on that. I would not set one American soldier in Ukrainian uh, soil, period. We don't need it. You're just giving them more ammunition, saying, see, aha, uh -huh, Americans have been always behind it. Of course, Let's face it, I mean, it, a raindrop could fall in Kazakhstan for, for one reason. Let's, pardon me, let's blame Americans, you know, that's really the world view. I, I agree, and, and that's part of the reason why I think it would be justified, but I also 
and probably it's probably a good thing that I don't run the country. Uh, okay, I think because, it's a good idea. But if I you think, do, I think Joe um, Biden and his team have done a good job. Uh, if you do run the country, I hope you have uh, a post for, for me in your cabinet. <laughs> uh, yes, at least I will I will advise you in terms of foreign relations. Well, maybe uh, ambassador to Albania, but definitely secretary of dance. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, maybe that will solve the, the conflicts. So, um, I know you believe that R Russia can be defeated yes. by the Ukrainian people. Absolutely. If they just have the right yeah. weapons and bullets and, and all of those things. There are more of them going in, by the way. Uh, Australia is sending them certain uh, Bushmasters, there are about 30 of them, or give and take. Okay? Is, is that so a type of gun or something? It, it's really a vehicle uh, a missile? that that is equipped to do everything, and it looks like it's mine-proof, meaning mites can do squat to those uh, Bushmasters. You know? Oh, okay. So, and then Germany, it looks like it's softening the the uh, the sense that, you know, they need to send uh, armaments there, and, and then we're doing our part. Pretty much every country is helping. Uh, and, you know, remarkably, I think the Ukrainian people in the army and their president they're doing a fantastic job you know they are they're doing a far better job yeah. than i would have thought they could do a month yeah. ago i uh, i thought i was one who thought oh my goodness russia is just going to run over them in three days you know that it was going to be a nothing for them to do it so it's been i've been pleasantly surprised to see that the right. ukrainian people fight as valiant, valiant, valiantly as they do and honestly, I think they've set a new benchmark for what we should expect from countries that want our help because uh, they've done awesome. You know, it boils down to one thing, or you believe in your country and you're willing to die and you believe who you are, you can have all the global the globalism, but it boils down to that kernel, that nationalism that drives pretty much that exists in the world today. If you're Ukrainian, you don't want to be called Russian because you're not one of them. If you're a Swede, if you're an Albanian, you will not be called something else, or Greek or Bulgarian, whatever. Right. That's a cornerstone. That's how nations manifest themselves from generation to generation. And when you look at Russian history, you know, they don't really, after the World War II, they haven't done great. I mean, they had Afghanistan right in the border there. And 20 years later, have to walk in, out, out of there, a, a defeated, you know, country. I remember that was uh, somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s that Russia right. had to leave, you yep. know, Afghanistan. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. I'd sure like to see him leave Ukraine, but I... I think they will. I think what Putin, and I'm not in his head, because he might not have anything upstairs working anyway, is that uh, he's trying to do is depopulate the regions of Donbass mm -hmm. and Lusank there, Luhans, I think they're the two small republics. And then gradually, you know, when you devastate the land, then gradually move some of the Russian population in there and then kind of acclaim, and then asking the people to declare uh, that they want to be a separate republic. Right. Having done that, then they can easily join the. Right, the and you're right. If he removes the population yeah. that's there, either through refugee yeah. status or by killing them. Right then you move in new people and then have them declare that they want their independence. But and borders, uh, borders stay pretty, very constant. Zelensky, as I said before, uh, I don't have, you know, a, a way of communicating with him, but he's doing a good job without my advice. But he should not sign one inch of Ukrainian land, period, not one inch. I was changing the map because um, as we're talking about this, um, I know roughly from my watching the news, okay, that this eastern section, okay, yes. this is Mariupol down yeah. there, uh, Donetsk, but yeah. this yeah. Either, and Kharkiv, yeah. that seems to be kind of a semicircle that I believe the majority of the Russian forces are in right now, right. Right. and then pushing east. I believe that they are shooting for this river that runs through the, the central part of Ukraine is kind of their threshold that they're hoping to achieve at a minimum. Okay, right. and again, I'm, I'm not in their head either, but just me looking at the ge geography, because that would also allow them to connect this yeah, southern land so bridge. Yeah, that's your Sea of Azov right there, farther down. 
that there, yes. that's the Sea of Azov, mm -hmm. and that means is that since it took Crimea, Correct. is that he's trying to build a bridge in there. There is a gap in there, there is a passage in there from the Black Sea to the Sea of Azov. He's going to build a bridge there, he's trying to go there, but he's trying, he's trying to get back to Odessa there, which is farther to your, to your Odessa, west, here. Right, right there, yeah, he's trying to get there. Mm -hmm. But he will not succeed because, as I mentioned before, the gates, Bosphorus gates, are closed for Russian ships, warships to pass through. Oh, and the Bosphorus gates are the and ones the down, there right there. down here by Istanbul and yeah, Turkey. That's right. Turkey okay. and will not open those. Now, civilian ships can pass through, but during the war, that it's yeah, it's closed. closed. So he can have all the ships he can have in Asian Sea here or Mediterranean, which is right there, uh, and they're not going to work. So it looks like the, the Ukrainians are doing a bang-up job. I think they, they sunk a couple of other small minor uh, I saw warships. that just yeah. in the last couple of days. Yeah. They yeah, did yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It looked like they were using drones and yes. videotaping or videotaping it at the time that they were also doing it. Oh, so yeah, yeah, sure. They made it to the news. But that's how they're going to prove it, otherwise Russia will, you know... Uh, will just deny and... Deny. It, 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 Russia has always been a close society, okay? It's a simple fact. I mean, starting with Ivan the Terrible, you know, 1500, and going there, okay? The only victory that Russia ever had, pretty much, was in the Battle of Poltava, which fought Charles VII, the Swedish monarch, against, basically, uh, Peter the Great. Okay. And then, gradually, during the World War, one, they collapsed. I mean, it collapsed completely. Okay. Hmm. And the World War Two, had we not, uh, people forget that we sent tons and tons of military aid to Stalin during the World War Two. You know, I, I, I believe you, and I parts yeah. of this I, I remember from my teachings, but I can tell that your Russian history is superior to mine. I, well, you just, these are the facts, you know, really, that's, that's the whole idea. It's important to know. That's how the world, world uh, evolves. If we don't know this, people wonder, well, where is it? Uh, well, it's been there for, for centuries. Yeah. And you see, one of the reasons why, when Russia went over to go to the Kiev there, through the Belarus, mm -hmm. there are some uh, marshes called Pripet marshes. And during the, when that thaws, during the springtime, it's impossible to pass through. Th that's another reason why they collapsed. You know, as you describe these things, I think of times, uh, I, I've done a more than average amount of study of the American Civil War, and there was a, a, a battle somewhere around Tennessee or in the Shenandoah Valley that it hit the spring, and the northern troops could not proceed right. because of the marsh. That is correct. I mean, yeah. Try carrying a 50-pound back, yeah. back in awesome. two feet of water and mud. You know, you'll, you'll quit really quick. To yeah. just make a point in there is that uh, this is nothing against the Russian people. I visited Russia twice in my lifetime. Wonderful, great people, very hospitable. They don't want any war more than you and I do. But you have a, a, a dictator in the power who pretty much dictates people. It reminds me of like really like Iran, the mullahs in Iran. Okay. Dictating people how to live lives from day to day. That's basically what he does in there, okay? Another thing what he's doing in there is, you know, he's throwing all this kind of a, we're gonna use nuclear weapons and blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. You know, he might as well sign the death certificate to his country if he does that, trust me. We can obliterate Russia ten times over. We, don't, we will not exist. But he tries to put this, you know, to kind of bait people. And people, oh, he's going to do that. He ain't going to do nothing. Well, that's why I wish when the first tank had rolled across the Ukrainian border that we would have just bombarded them with missiles and whatever else, rockets and everything that we could, and just say, no, the line is back there. Right. And just stopped right. it right at that point, which is a very tough line to draw. Oh, sure. When the other side hasn't fired a shot yet, really, right? right? But you have to remember, when we live in a democracy, you know, you have to have, it's not perfect, but I'll take yes. democracy any other system any time. We can be messy, no question about it, but you have to have the consensus. We have our major branches in a government, which hardly exists anywhere else. You know, you have to go through the Senate and you have to go through the House and get a resolution and all that stuff. It's it slow and messy, but it's better than anything else. That's right. right.
But the two things that you can stop Russia very quick, very quick, it takes bold moves, basically. And I don't pretend to be a military expert, but I've read enough history to know how you can defeat a monster like him. I'm waiting but, for you to drop the other shoe there and tell us what that is. Well, two, two things. One, if Europe had the guts to cut off the oil, period. Right. All the oil that, that Europe buys, right. especially. That means that there is no income. You can't not finance your war without money. That's one. China cannot provide that amount of, uh, of financing. Neither can India, because those are kind of a neutral. Okay. The second thing is that what if Zelensky had the means and he starts shooting a couple of things in Moscow and, right. and taking the war on their territory, Russian territory, you can see a change in Russian military very quick because uh, I long, agree. Yeah, but and he well, might because, be forced to do it though. Well, because they have, um, so at his home, they may not be able to see this well, but that's the border right, of Ukraine. Right, 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 right. And I know that there have been times, I think in this Belgorod right, right here. Right, right, Volgorod, yeah. One yeah. or two of these other cities. Right, right. But Moscow Ukraine. is not very far from there. Okay. Right. Not, not very far. I probably have to back out here just a little bit. But, okay, so there are lots of weapons that would reach yeah. from Kiev to Moscow. Oh, easy. Yes. Easy, easy, easy. Now... The other thing there is that if that does happen, they can guarantee that Belarus, that Alexander Lukashenko, who's been there for 20 odd years as a dictator, he yeah. probably tops Putin, but he is in a Putin, a Putin's pocket. He will fall. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, yeah. No, Belarus yeah. has had uh, several times in the last couple of years where reporters or whatever were yanked off planes and incarcerated or killed or something like that. Very, very easy. These are, it reminds me of, to go back, just bring Albania in the picture. Okay. That was one of the most orthodox dictatorships, a communist dictatorship, bar none. Enver Hoxha wanted to even surpass Stalin. If you think Stalin was ha ha ha, Hoxha wanted to be even more, meaning stricter. Hoda? Hoxha. Hoxha. He was a, a dictator of Albania for over 40 years. Okay. He, like the country was like a prison. I'm talking about Albanian people. And that's what Lukashenko is doing to Belarus and actually Putin is doing to, but the difference now is that you have all these new gadgets now. You know, the news get out. Thanks to the internet and thanks to the, you know. Yeah, look at what just came out of the Supreme Court in the last day or two. That was a, that was a shock. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, just to mention in there, you know, is that you see, I don't like to tamper with the, myself, with a certain constitutional things to preserve the republic. That particular, it's a law of the land. Leave it alone. I, I would agree. I, if you structure the family correctly, then you can reduce the abortions a hundred times more or better. But I, I agree, but that's another discussion. Yes, I'm right, sure right. we would find ourselves agreeing on a lot with that right. there. Um, uh, back, back to this here, because we've probably been into this uh, about 30 minutes, I'm guessing, right now. I'm not looking at a clock, yeah, yeah. but I'm trying to think of, of what other points uh, uh, that we could bring up. I mean, uh, Well, right now, uh, from what I read, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Is that actually the war is tilting towards the winning, tilting towards Ukraine, actually. I would sure like to see that. Uh, that steel plant in Mariupol, I mean, is, uh, I mean, still I hear hundreds of people that are in there, even though hundreds have gotten out. Oh, and sure. and I got to think that more and more that anybody still there is probably more likely a soldier than, uh, than well, a housewife. Uh, absolutely. You absolutely. Know? But, you know, on the good side, you know, I think Europeans now are beginning to see the picture. And one of them is that a lot of refugees, uh, you know, Albania took over 1,200 Ukrainian refugees, no questions asked. They can come and stay in the country there. They can transport or, you know, use that as a venue to go wherever they want to, or they can form a new life. Right. So, you know, even the small countries are helping there, you know. I, I believe like, that too. Moldova is doing a great job. So is Poland. And all those nations in there who were at one time under the Russian dictatorship, they're seeing that, hey, we're not going to stand by. We're going to fight. Well, I'm glad that we have people in countries over there in order to help with that. 
Uh, because uh, about a week ago, I heard a figure of like eight million or eight point five million, something right. like that, yeah. for the They've amount of displaced. refugees. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, which is huge, you know, especially in so short a time, you know, yeah. in, in a little over a month. But if it was successful, there would have been more. But now, there the war has turned the tide and has stalled. The Russian military has stalled right now, okay? Meaning is they're not going anywhere. Oh, he can bomb, he can do what he wants to, you know, but you can't just take that. It's not uh, the city. It's not yeah. like a piece of furniture. You just take it and put it in your own. You can't do it. It's going to stay there. No. Uh, no, yeah. but speaking of that theory, I, I read an article um, somewhere in the past week about Russian soldiers are doing a systematic uh, style of thievery where literally they're going in, there was a John Deere factory or a sure, John Deere uh, farm somewhere yeah, yeah. with, I don't know how much, but a substantial amount of major farm equipment. Correct. And they literally loaded it on trucks or onto trains and shipped it back to Russia, at which point they uh, had to discover that there was some sort of phone app that was necessary that could disable it. Now, I'm sure Russia has scientists and, and sure tech people that can figure that over time. Yeah. But the immediate reaction was they stole a bunch of worthless equipment. Well, they're stealing that. They're stealing some of the old relics in uh, in Ukraine. You know, but uh, the historically speaking, you, during the World War II, mm -hmm. in, we dropped two bombs in, in Japan, Hiroshima Correct. and Nagasaki, right? Right. But the city of Dresden in Germany was 10 times more devastated by bombing than having a nuclear bomb dropped in them. With just conventional bombs. Correct. And yes. the city of Dresden today is flourishing. So Maripool, it will flourish too. I look forward to that. Um, yeah. We'll I, have another conversation. I, I, I have an idea. What's that? When you build something, we'll go and visit it together. You know, I would love that. I uh, There's a part of me that in the last 10 years, I would say, uh, Somewhere during the Trump administration that my feeling on this changed, probably about the time that uh, Khashoggi got killed by Saudi Arabia, Correct. that my feelings yeah. began to change on some of my international travel. But visiting Russia is something that I've always wanted to do. It's but a beautiful be landscape. But because of the, uh, the, the incarcerating of some American citizens sure. over there, and they're always claimed to be a spy or a drug user or something, but I got to feel that they're just taking hostages to have something to negotiate with. No, that's what they do. Yeah. That's what they're doing in here, see? Now, we have one basketball player, a female. <coughs> right. As a matter of fact, she played basketball for one of the great Russian teams over there. All of a sudden, she's doing this. Well, she didn't do that, and she's been playing there for a number of years. And that's what they actually do, you know. These people plan. I just want to, uh, my personal experience, when I went to Moscow the first time, okay, I landed, there are two airports called Shermetyevo 1 and Shermetyevo 2. My passport was brand new, because you have to renew your passport. Right. I mean, that's what we do here. Correct. So I didn't have no stamps from any country, okay? Okay. Yeah. And they stopped me. Like they, held me they held me there for 10 days. And what country were you in? It was in Moscow. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. For 10, and did they tell you to stay at a hotel, or did they hold no, you? No, they, they locked us up right at the airport. Really? Yeah. Wow. But, we well, know we're getting a subject, but this is life experiences. I bought me a small boom box there at the airport okay. and some CDs. At midnight, the airport would shut down. There were a couple people there. There were two Germans, uh, two Kazakhstanis, one, Ar one Armenian. Are you going to uh, tell me you were doing dance lessons at the Russian airport uh, with your boom box? You have that right. Uh, <laughs> midnight Tango in Moscow. That's the name of the... Of the uh, a little uh, title, if you want to call it. Okay. So, but that's what they do. What they wanted me to do, actually, is they wanted me to pay. They wanted to bribe me. If I paid twenty five hundred dollars, I could fly back home the next day. Why? I had my ticket returned in the following week. Why am I going to pay twenty five hundred? All you had to do was stay there and that, listen to tango music for a week. That's what they do. So, okay. you know, that's the way the system works in there. But they put fear in people. That's what they do. But I, I, th I don't think Ukrainians are afraid of Russians. I can. I, I don't think they are. They're not. They, so they're not. I would say they're not because I. I wish if I were ever confronted with what the Ukrainians have been in the last month or six weeks that I could respond as well. I mean, uh, it's it, it's been remarkable what they have done. Uh, humanity, when it comes, when it's pushed to the wall, you know, they really start fighting back. 
yes. they will do it. It's it just in, in, in part of being a human being, you know, because your existence is at stake. And that's for the nation of, uh, of Ukrainian people. Well, they've certainly... But you have to know you have close to 45, 46 million Ukrainians, 130 million Russians, right? Yes. Almost three yes, times Yes, I've heard those much. numbers, yes. Okay. And look at 70 days in the war, and they haven't done much. I'm talking about the Russians. Right. Well, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I, I think we're about uh, talked out on it, unless there's any last subject that you, you want no, to throw No, I just in. wanted to say that, you know, all the small countries like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, uh, including Moldova, I mentioned Albania. By the way, in the border of Poland and Ukraine, we have 12,000 Albanians who are helping there with the refugees. So everybody's stepping up. We don't buy any oil from Russia or gas or anything like that. Now, what the Zelensky had requested Albanian parliament is to not allow Russian tourists land in Albania. That's kind of a little uh, touchy subject because some of those people might just want to leave Russia as an excuse and right. then never go back. So how do you, you know? Well, and I did hear news stories about that three weeks ago or so that uh, Russians were um, immigrating out and leaving the country when they could. So limiting tourism, I mean, you stop I, a lot of that. Right, but I, I think, just before we, we finish, is that probably just as many Russians as Ukrainians have been displaced. I'm talking about Russians willingly. You know, they probably left, I, I don't have figures, but easy four or five million Russians have left since this war. They don't want to have part of it. I would, I would love to meet one of those Russian people and be able to hear their opinion, because I think you're right. I just... You know, hearing it from the horse's mouth means Some so much. Some of them actually landed in Turkey. Yes? Yep. They said, we don't have anything to do with it. Well, good. They said, when you chase your citizens of your country, I mean, for no reason at all. I mean, if your country is not, why would he invade a country that hasn't done anything to you? I just don't get it. But in his head, I'm talking about Putin, you know, he thinks he's bigger than Peter the Great. He wants to create this a Russian empire. It's an illusion. It doesn't exist. Right. Russia has always been a regional power. So is China. They will never amount to much. They will not be able to do, let's say, what our country does. Okay. I'm disappointed that India is not stepping up. But the bottom line is that you look at this scenario. Will the Russian bear want to be better, building a better friendship with Europe, or wants to be dominated by dragon, China? China has its own uh, designed like in Vladivostok, for example, which is way there where Kam Kamchatka Peninsula is there. Yes. Then Russia has problems with Japan, the Northern Territories. There's never been an agreement there. Japan has never signed an agreement because those territories belong to Japan. Of course, they're occupied by Russians. It's a uh, mess. I worry about that. I worry about Taiwan, I, I know, even South Korea. You yeah. know, that if the tyrants learn that they can flex their muscles and take over land and that the West won't react in a way to stop it. What's to stop them from picking the next one? I remember Europeans after the World War II, thanks to American ingenuity and money and resources, is that they have become very affluent. When you become very affluent, affluent in terms of living conditions, we kind of have become quite sedentary, meaning, you know, we just kind of a plow, we don't care. We have five cars in the garage and we have these mansions and all this and all that. And, but that's not how the world works. You have to keep always be on uh, the alert, especially when you, as they say, history repeats itself, not maybe every day, but it almost will be 20 years. Now you're starting to justify my actions of sending boots on the ground. Yeah, but I, I love this country way too much. I don't see, we have Americans who've died almost in every country. You have in Normandy, you have <coughs> 60, 70,000 uh, graves in there, and in Belgium and all that. There's a lot of Americans who've died in plenty places. We don't need to have them die anymore. Give the people the tools so they do the job. I, I really like, uh, I would really like to be proven wrong and to see the policy uh, succeed and Russia to withdraw. You you will, you will. We'll talk this over a cup of coffee one day. Maybe in the next month we'll talk again. Yeah. Okay, well Isaac, thank you for coming today. My pleasure, today. and for having me here, I appreciate it. it, okay? 
My and pleasure. Have a great day. You too. Here, one second. Thank you all for watching. Isla Lepage, Eric Meeks, signing off. Bye bye. <coughs>